Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. If you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the campaigns, but before we get started I do like to go over a few new discoveries I just found out about in the past week. And I don't have too much to cover, but I do have one thing I want to point out, and that's if you are interested in the campaign Trailblazer, which just launched on Kickstarter, I just want you to know that there is a very similar campaign that should be launching in July, and this campaign is called Hike It, which has a a very similar theme you're going to be hiking through a trail bringing along your backpack full of gear and then taking advantage of the items that you have pushing your luck along the trail and trying to get as far as you can to collect the most victory points at the end of the game this one has a little bit more of a danger to the theme whereas trailblazer is a little bit more on the scenic route i don't know which one you might like better and i haven't looked into hike it any more than what i just described i just saw that it was a very similar campaign and if you are backing trailblazer you might want to be aware of that or you might want to just back for a dollar now because I'm sure the PM will still remain open in the month of July if you want to see both campaigns and weigh your options at that time and see which one is most interesting for you. And as always, if you want a bit more of a heads up into the board games that are launching in the future, definitely go ahead and check out Board Game Co's channel because Alex over at Board Game Co puts out a video at the end of each month covering the following month and giving you a high level of all the games that are going to be launching over the following 30 days. If you haven't checked out his channel yet, I highly recommend it and it's one of the channels that I always tune into and you can find a link to his channel in the description below. And the first two campaigns we have launching this week is going to be Anunnaki, which is launching on the 16th, and then the Artemis Project, which is launching on the 17th. And these are both campaigns that I have covered in the past, but they got delayed and pushed this week. So if you do tune into my videos every week, first of all, thank you so much. But also feel free to skip ahead to the timestamps down below, because I'm just going to go ahead and roll my previous footage here if you didn't see those previous episodes plays one to four players and takes about 60 to 120 minutes to play and one thing that i think is worth mentioning is this one is being co-designed by simone luciani who has designed one of my favorite euro games of all time which is tolkien the main calendar but he also co-designed like four other games that are in the top 100 on board game geek which is a pretty incredible feat this guy really knows what he's doing so i think that can give you a lot of confidence in this game or at least give you a good reason to check it out and this is a low luck 4x euro game hybrid that's set in an ancient dystopian past where mythology and science fiction have come together to create a world where portals have opened up granting access to interstellar travel each player is going to be representing their own house as they travel to these different planets and traveling from planet to planet can be pretty impressive especially in an ancient past and players are taking full advantage of this because they're actually going to be posing as gods to the inhabitants of these planets as you compete to build bases recruit troops develop new technologies defeat local Local dominions that might push back against you as well as the other players and take planets for all the resources before moving on to the next one. Absolutely savage. But the different actions that the players can perform will provide a certain number of immediate victory points, but there's also some random endgame goals that are drawn at the start of the game that are going to provide some variable ways to earn victory points that are earned at the end of the game. And a really neat thing about the way the action selection works in this game is that you're going to have all sorts of action paths on your board and you're going to get a really powerful bonus if you're able to perform the actions by following one of those paths in sequential order but that does come at a cost of restricting you to that path and doing every action in that order which isn't always the most beneficial so instead you can also jump freely from action to action you're just going to be foregoing a really powerful bonus that might be worth thinking about before you jump to your next action and of of course the player with the most victory points at the end of the game is going to win the game and I have links to this campaign in the description below. And this plays 1 to 5 players and takes about 60 to 75 minutes to play. And this is an expansion for the game, The Artemis Project. And this is a Euro game where you're going to be putting out dice workers in order to take your actions. And the way that this game works is that each round you're going to be drawing an event card. And the event card is going to specify a location. And the way that this comes into play is that you're going to be putting that event marker out on whichever location on the board that the card specifies. And then later in the round you're going to be resolving those action spaces in sequential order. And then whenever that action space with the event marker gets triggered that event is going to occur and affect whatever players meet the criteria of that card. The players are each going to have their own player board to keep track of their resources and any upgrades as well as their worker dice. 
Each round, all players will roll their dice, and then they're going to take turns putting one die out on the board at a time. And there's a few different areas on the board where players can put their dice, and I think the thing that makes this game so good is the really clever way that the dice worker placement works. Because any place that grants resources, you're going to get resources equal to the number of pips on your die, but the dice with the lower value are going to get resolved first, and there's only a limited amount of resources for each round. So you could possibly get more resources by playing a higher die, but you're also taking a higher risk because everyone else will get their resources first and there might not be anything left by the time it gets to you. And I should probably mention the theme of this game because this one takes place on one of the moons of Jupiter where players are mining for resources and developing colonies with limited supplies and harsh conditions. There's also some action spaces on the board that work a little bit more traditionally but then there's also going to be some different tiles that will get mixed into the game on the side of the board and these will vary in the order that they come out from game to game. There's expedition cards where players can actually put multiple of their dice and the reason for that is because players are trying to have the highest overall value because there's two actions per card and whoever has the highest value is going to get first choice of those actions and whoever has second is going to get the second action and anyone below that doesn't get to use the action at all. There's also building cards that can grant players victory points as well as permanent special abilities and in order to put your dice on those you're trying to get the highest value but you want to have as low a value as possible because the value of your die is essentially acting as your bid so you want to put a value there that no one else is going to outbid you on but you also don't want to bid too high because you're actually going to have to pay that amount in resources and a higher value means that you're paying more for that building card. And I don't need to mention that the artwork for this one is incredible. But the two expansions that are going to be introduced in this campaign are going to be adding two major ways to change up the game. The first one is the Satellites expansion, which is going to offer some off-board locations that players can access in order to modify the action spaces on the main board. And then there's the Commander expansion, which is going to introduce a type of colonist that players can use to their advantage to upgrade or modify their dice or assist in endgame scoring. This is definitely one worth checking out and it is a game that already has a ton of reviews and content on it already and you can go out and play it yourself. All I hear is good things about this game and I think it's a ton of fun as well. And of course there's links in the description below. And the next campaign we have also launching on May 17th is called Joystick Heroes and this plays 2-6 to six players and takes about 30-60 to 60 minutes to play. And this is a competitive game where players are going to be going to an arcade, trying to win as many games as possible to earn tickets and then trade those tickets in for prizes which will earn them victory points at the end of the game. And the way that this game works is at the start of the game players are going to draw a number of random cards from the arcade deck and then you're going to be putting those into a shared tableau and each of those cards is going to represent an arcade game. Players will also choose a character board and then they'll be using that to track their skills which they'll be able to upgrade throughout the game. And the way that this game works is that each round is played over two phases. First there's the play phase where players will take turns spending a token on one of the game cards and then they'll be able to play that game. Each of the arcade cards will also have a number of icons on them which represent the skills that are needed in order to be proficient at that game. So if you level up those skills on your character you're going to have a little bit of an edge if you go to play those games. And the way that this works is that you're going to be rolling a number of dice depending on your skills and then you can also use any power cards you have to modify those rolls and try to increase your high score to as high as possible because you're going to get a different number of prize tokens depending on the score that you achieve. And then once all players have gone we move on to the power up phase where players can then spend those tickets for prizes which are worth victory points at the end of the game or instead you can choose to trade them in for upgrades or power cards which will help you in the later rounds of the game. The game continues like this until all players have used up all their tokens play in the games and then the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins. And the next campaign also launching on the 17th is called Kingdoms of Acandia and this plays one to four players and takes about 90 to 600 minutes to play and that's because this is a narrative campaign adventure game where you can play as much or as little as you want in a single setting but the game plays over a series of chapters and sub chapters that will progress as certain events or objectives are achieved and players will be working cooperatively to follow the narrative and win or lose the game together. And each player is going to be playing as their own unique asymmetrical character and they're going to have different skills, different magic magic or melee classes, and different abilities and strengths and immunities that are upgradable as the game goes on. Players also will be starting in their own unique location on the board with their own castle, and each character also comes with its own unique goal that can get character specific upgrades for that character. Although players start separately, it's not too difficult to find each other on the board and then work together and there are benefits to that because if you get into battle, you can help to attack and defend together and that does give you an edge, but you might want to separate depending on your own unique goals because there might be something over there that you want to help you reach your specific goal and help you level up, whereas some of your teammates might want to go at another location that might benefit them. 
and the game's played over a very detailed board that's going to outline the entire world. And this board is broken into a sort of grid with labels on each of the grids so you can identify them. And this is important at different points in the game because different objectives or enemy cards might specify where different items or enemies spawn on the board. And the way this game works is that depending on the chapter that players are playing, there might be some specific rules or setup requirements. And then there's going to be a few sub chapters to each of those chapters. And those might also come with some small tweaks to the rules. And the game's going to be played over a series of rounds where each player is going to have a number of action points that they can use in order to move around the board, visit different locations, and gain resources. Players all have their own actions, but they can spend them in any order amongst each other. After the players have performed all their actions, the enemies will get a turn where you're going to roll dice for each of the enemies, and that's going to dictate which direction they move. And if enemies end up moving together, they form a horde, which means that they just stay together for the rest of the game until they're defeated. But enemies can also do things like block resources, or if they move onto one of the player's castles, they're going to siege that castle, and players are going to have to go back there to try and protect it. Or they could also move into one of the character's current locations, which would trigger a battle with that character. Combat in this game is done through dice rolling, and the attacking character is going to be the player to go first, but then the defending player will be able to defend themselves through the use of dice and their abilities, and then it's going to alternate back and forth until one side or the other is defeated, and that would trigger the end of the battle. And of course, players can also upgrade their weapons and armor and skills, and also create potions to help give them an edge in battle. And if the players are able to complete the chapter's objectives while also defeating any of the enemies that come into their way, then they will have won that chapter and can move on to the following one. And the game continues like this with new rules and mechanisms being added periodically as players complete the campaign and a single campaign can take anywhere from 35 to 65 hours to complete. And the next campaign we have is also launching on May 17th, and this one's called Union Stockyards. And this plays two to five players, it takes about 45 to 90 minutes to play. And this is a competitive Euro game where players are one of the big five meat packers out in the Union Stockyards back in 1865. And in this game, players are gonna be steering the market in their favor, delegating tasks for their workers while paying them enough to avoid them going on strike as you try to manage your livestock and become the wealthiest packager in the world. And the centerpiece of this game seems to be the mechanism around the way that the economy works, but then also the focus on historic accuracy. And in this game, all the livestock will cost the same for all players. And at the start of a round, an event card will be drawn that helps or harms all players. And then players are going to be taking turns performing their actions, trying to manage their livestock and build different facilities in order to process that livestock and try to get the most victory points. There's also a really interesting polyomino mechanism here where players will be gaining and spending different building cards in order to build buildings out on the shared grid. And this represents expanding the town as players build up new facilities. Each building comes with its own benefit that will give a permanent upgrade to the player that builds it, but you're also limited by the space on the board, so depending on the decisions of the other players and the remaining space, there may not be a place for you to build your building, so you really want to be careful when you are playing those cards. I also read through a few of these designer diaries and it looks like there's a lot of attention to detail with this game and even the building meeples in this game have some custom designs so that they are more representative of the types of buildings that you would have seen during that time. You can get a little bit of an idea of how the buildings work in this image here but these are all with prototype components and the actual buildings will look a lot cooler. I really love to see passion and polish put into a game and when I see designers that are really meticulous with these little details, it usually ends up creating a really awesome experience. And it's those little details that can really make games feel like their theme matters and to make one game feel very different from another. At the end of the round, the livestock costs go up or down depending on the demand caused by the player's decisions, but the value of the livestock is completely dependent on their relative position in the market, so if there is more of a particular animal, that one's going to be worth less because the market is saturated with it, so players can try to use this to their advantage and control the amount of livestock that they have in order to manipulate the value of those livestock in the market. This designer only really has one other game published, so there is also a risk with newer designers, so of course do your own research. And I always recommend to read the rulebook or to try the game in a digital version to really understand if this is a game for you. But I have high hopes for this one, and it looks like the designer did a really great job. Also launching on the 17th, we have a campaign for a bunch of expansions for games that are published by Board Game Tables, and these are going to be expansions for Kabuto Sumo, On Tour, QE, and Bytes. I'll just go over each of these in a little bit of detail, tell you how the original game plays, and then tell you what the expansion is going to add to the game. First we have Kabuto Sumo, which is a bug sumo wrestling game where players are going to be pushing pieces on a small board, and the pieces that you push on are going to push other pieces around, and each player is going to have their own colored bug in that board, and you want to be the last player left on the board in order to win the game. 
and each of the player's bug meeple will be associated with a asymmetrical bug wrestler, and there's going to be more wrestlers added in the Total Mayhem expansion, as well as various items to be used as weapons and new victory conditions. And then we have QE, which is an economic game where players are playing as banks of different countries, and there are large companies that need bailing out, and players are going to be bidding on those different companies, printing money in order to buy those companies, but also trying to balance the amount of money that you print because you could potentially send your country into economic suicide. And the expansion for this one is going to add a bunch of commodities that players can purchase, such as gold, oil, or crypto. And it also offers some different ways for you to lower your total spending throughout the game. And then we have on tour, which is a really interesting roll and write where players are each in their own band. And you're going to be traveling around a map trying to visit as many locations as possible because whoever visits the most locations at the end of the game wins. And the way that players visit locations is that each round there's going to be two dice that get rolled and these are both D10s. And then players can combine the two values that they see in any order to form a two digit number. And then you're going to write that number somewhere on your own personal map. This continues until your entire board is filled, and then you're gonna be starting at the lowest number of your board and then connecting a line to the adjacent space that has the next lowest number above that number. And then you just keep doing this until you can no longer connect any numbers, and then you count up all the spaces that you're able to connect, and the player who has the most wins the game. And the Paris and New York expansion is actually a standalone expansion that you can play completely on its own, and it's going to introduce a new mechanism where players will have to use riverboats or ferries to reach certain destinations on their board. And the next game they're offering is Bites, which plays 2-5 to five players, it takes about 20 minutes to play, and in this game players are going to be taking turns moving different colored ants across a trail of different food items, and the food items are also going to have a few different colors on them, and whenever a player moves an ant of a certain color, they have to move it to an item that matches that color, and then pick up an adjacent food item to keep for themselves. The catch here is that the different food items will be worth different amounts at the end of the game, because whichever ant reaches the end of the trail first, those matching color food items are going to be worth the most at the end of the game. But that's not the only way that scoring works in this game because at the start of each game you're going to be drawing four random variable scoring cards and that's going to modify the way that players can earn victory points and create a lot of variability from game to game. And this new recipes expansion is going to be adding a bunch of new variable scoring cards for players to have even more variability from game to game. And Board Game Tables has an excellent track record publishing some great games with really impressive artwork and it's no surprise to me that this one is our Discord pick of the week so if these look interesting to you I definitely recommend checking out their campaign. All of these games are really solid designs and would make an excellent addition if you're looking for a few more filler games for your collection. And the next campaign launching on the 17th is Thunderstone Quest, and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 60-90 to 90 minutes to play, and this one is going to be my personal pick of the week for a few reasons. First of all, this is a game that's been around for a while, and you can have a lot of confidence in the design on this one. It's definitely a solid game, and a lot of people really love this one. A 7.9 is nothing to sneeze at. Something that I really like about this game is that even though it is a deck building game, the whole focus isn't on the deck building, and there's a bit of a worker placement element there, and a little bit of a push your luck element as well. I really do enjoy the deck building mechanism and I do appreciate games like Dominion that are purely focused on deck building, but personally I find it a little exhausting doing that same loop of cycling through your cards over and over again, and I prefer to have my deck building as a portion of the game and not the entire game. And the way that this game blends a few other elements together is that players will be starting with a hand of 12 cards that they'll be able to build throughout the game. The players also start with a side quest card and a guild card which will give them some special abilities but also an objective that they can try to achieve early in the game. And on a player's turn they're going to be drawing six cards into their hand and then they're going to get to decide if they want to visit the village or if they want to visit the dungeon. And if players want to visit the village there's a little bit of a worker placement element there because you're going to visit a specific spot in the village. And these different locations can help you gain tokens in future turns, upgrade your cards, heal your characters, or even gain new cards to add into your deck. This is interesting because you can do this action and then potentially use none of the cards that you just drew into your hand. But the second half of going to the village is that you can also use any cards that you drew that have a village action on them. And then you can choose to play those cards if you want, but then all your cards will get discarded whether you use them or not at the end of your turn. But if you'd rather go hunt some monsters, you can choose not to go to the village and go into the dungeon instead. And there's different levels to the dungeon, which is represented by the different tiers of cards here located on the right of the board. And players will be spending light from the different cards that they have or light tokens that they collected from the village. And that will help you get deeper into the dungeon. The deeper into the dungeon you go, the more rewarding and challenging monsters you can fight. 
But the interesting aspect here and where a little bit of push your luck is introduced into the game is that you're actually incentivized to stay into the dungeon because you'll stay at that tier of the dungeon as long as you don't go back to the village. So on your following turn you don't have to spend those light tokens or cards to get into the deep layers of the dungeon. And that will allow you to get access to those stronger monsters at a lower cost. But of course the village is where you're going to be going to upgrade your character, heal your character, and get more resources to help you in the dungeon. And you'll be running out of all of that the longer that you stay in the dungeon, so you don't want to stay in there for too long. And the player that has the most victory points from victory points earned by the cards that they collected, as well as experience earned throughout the game, is going to win the game. And the last campaign we have launching on the 19th is Saw Ray, and this is a campaign that I did cover in the past, but it got delayed until now. I didn't have a whole lot of info on this game when I covered it back then, but it looks like they added a bit more details to their campaign, going into a little bit about how the cards work and the different types of cards that exist, as well as the different buildings that players can get and the different upgrades that they can grant to the players that build them. Because I didn't have a whole lot of info when I did that previous video, I just gave you a quick overview of the game from what I knew, but if it does sound interesting to you, definitely check out the campaign because it looks like they added a lot more. And I'll go ahead and roll that footage for you now. And this is a competitive city building game where each player is given a plot of land and equal resources at the start of the game. And then you're going to be building up a little bit of a tableau, deciding which buildings you want to make because those are going to grant you some different abilities which you can use on future turns. And then you're going to be building up your city based on your plan in order to score victory points. Unfortunately, I looked all over the interwebs and I couldn't find a whole lot of info on this game, but it does play over three phases. First, there's the planning phase where you're going to be choosing what type of building you want to build. And the next phase is the production phase where players will be using a push your luck mechanism to try and get more and more resources but if you push too far you could bust because your worker force will revolt against you. But the nice thing here is that you can also use the abilities from buildings that you've built on a previous turn to help give you a little bit of an edge and make pushing your luck just a little bit safer. And then finally there is the construction phase where players will be spending the resources that they generated in order to build more buildings but you can also trade your resources with other players or with the board itself in order to gain the resources that you need and of course this is going to create a little bit of an engine where you're building buildings to generate more resources which you can then use to build more buildings. And the push your luck mechanism seems to be the centerpiece of the design here so if you are interested in this one I definitely recommend looking into more of that. I scoured the internet and couldn't find any more information on it so it sounds like they're only going to be announcing this on the actual campaign when it launches. So I apologize in advance that I don't have the answer for you right now. But if you want to know more you can check out the link in the description below and you can also follow along to get the publisher's very first game added to your pledge completely for free. And those are all the campaigns, but don't leave yet because we have four awesome giveaways to announce and these are the easiest giveaways to enter ever. All you have to do is leave a comment down below. I don't ask for anything in return for this. You don't have to like, you don't have to subscribe, you don't even have to say nice things to me. The whole reason I started doing this was just as a fun way to give back to all the viewers of this channel, which I'm hugely appreciative for. And this first giveaway is going to be a ton of fun because this one is for Tiny Epic Vikings. And this is by far the Tiny Epic game that I'm the most interested in. This is a game that plays over three eras where players are going to be drafting cards into their hand and try to have the most presence in different islands in order to gain different tokens because different runes are worth victory points at the end of the game. So you're going to be collecting those runes in different ways, but then also influencing the value of those runes because you want your runes to be worth the most. And if you're a fan of Blood Rage, I think you'll really want to check this one out because not only does it share the same theme, it does have a lot of mechanisms that are reminiscent of the gameplay in Blood Rage. But as I say that, I really want to emphasize that this game is doing its own thing and I'm really impressed with the design on this one. It looks super streamlined, it looks really thought out, and the way that it distills that whole Blood Rage-esque package into something smaller and different and travel size is really impressive and the game looks like a ton of fun. This was my pick of the week last week and I go in a lot more detail on that video so definitely go ahead and check out that video from last week if you want to know more into the details of the gameplay and why I'm so impressed with this one. But I probably shouldn't hype up this game too much before I announce the giveaway because this one is going to be a little bit different because the publisher wanted to offer something that they could give you immediately and not something that you have to wait a year or more to receive. So this giveaway is generously donated by Gameland Games but it's going to be for Tiny Epic Dungeons which will be shipped out to you immediately and this is another one of their Tiny Epic games that has an amazing rating on Board Game Geek with a 7.8 and I'll say it again that this is going to be for a deluxe edition of Tiny Epic Dungeons so that's pretty awesome. 
And to do this giveaway, just leave a comment down below with the hashtag tinyepic and then put a space and then whatever word you think forms the best title for the next Tiny Epic game or a Tiny Epic game that you would really love to see out on the market. For myself, I'm going to go with Tiny Epic Agricola because I love that game, but I do have some issues with the way that the scoring works and the complexity of the scoring, so I was really excited when Caverna came out, but then they got rid of those cards, which was the heart of Agricola, so I just want more versions of Agricola until someone gets it right. So maybe a Tiny Epic version would get it to where I want it to be. But I still want like 200 of those ability cards at the very least. And the next giveaway we have is for a Pledge for Damask, and this is a game about creating patterned silk fabrics where players are going to be using a really interesting mechanism, collecting different colored cubes from the circular board. And the way that, that works is that you can collect cubes from that board starting from a color, but then as soon as you have two of the same color, you have to stop drawing those cubes. But then you can only really guarantee that you keep the cubes that you need because any of the damask patterns that you haven't built yet, you can put the cubes that are required for it on that damask, but then any of the color cubes that you've collected that you don't have a use for yet go into your overflow where other players could potentially steal those from you. And players are going to be trying to collect different sets of these cubes in order to build the different damasks, chaining together damasks that have the same patterns or colors, because matching those up and creating those sets is going to give you the most victory points at the end of the game, and the player with the most victory points wins the game. In this giveaway, we'll get you the base pledge plus the micro expansion. And to enter this giveaway, just leave a comment down below with the hashtag Damask and let us know of a hobby or craft or skill that you have that you use to create things. A kind of cool thing about me that I don't really advertise because I never really find time for it anymore is that the whole reason I got into this board game content creation is because I was interested in board game design and I actually have designed a few games. I'm still working on them, so there's not going to be a Kickstarter right away here. And one of my most proud designs is the Great Wide Open, which you can go ahead and check out on Board Game Geek if you want to see it. But it's a really cool survival game where you crash land in the middle of the wilderness and you're trying to scavenge and survive because nature is trying to kill you because you do not belong there. I know this looks pretty much done and it is completely playable, but there's a few things that I really want to tweak and I just haven't got around to figuring them out yet. But if you think this looks cool, or if you just want to see what that final product actually ends up being whenever I find time to continue to work on this, you can head over to my website at shelfclutter.com, scroll all the way to the bottom, and you can subscribe to my newsletter. And maybe a newsletter is giving it a little bit too much credit because I never actually send out any emails. But when I do finish this game, I will send out emails just letting you know. So that's pretty much the purpose of this subscribe down here. So if you want to get a notification when I do finish the game, and if you want to see more on it, subscribe and at some point in the future I don't know when you will get an email saying that this game is complete I'll definitely provide some print and play files and a TTS if you want to try it out for yourself and if I do get enough interest maybe I'll even end up launching a campaign I mean it'd be pretty cool to cover my own campaign in one of these videos that's not bias is it and the next giveaway we have is for IT Startup Office Lockdown. And this is a game about trying to complete as many story points as you can to complete a project. And if you're not familiar with story points, that is how you measure effort in the development world. And players will be running their own startup company, hiring developers and other employees that might affect the performance of those developers. And then you're going to be putting those cards out in your tableau, but then each round they're going to earn you a number of story points, but then they're also going to earn a burnout token. And the other characters that you put out might affect the burnout tokens that get distributed, or they might remove or add burnout tokens depending on their individual abilities. Players can also do a little bit to sabotage their opponents or to poach their employees and convince them to come work for them. The first player to reach a certain number of story points is going to complete their project first and then they win the game. And this giveaway is going to be for a standalone version of this game and to end of this giveaway I'm going to be doing it a little bit differently. Instead of leaving a comment down below just check out the link in the description that will take you over to our discord and all you have to do to enter the giveaway is go to the giveaways channel on the discord and then click the little emoji underneath the giveaway. And I have all notifications turned off on the Discord by default, but if you want to get notified of any time we post a giveaway on the Discord, head over to the Rules channel and clicking the little gift underneath the post will sign you up for notifications for any time I post a giveaway on the Discord, and that'll just get sent to your Discord app if you have it installed on your phone. And the winner will get automatically drawn at the end of next week, so if you have entered any of these giveaways on the Discord or if you do in the future, just make sure that you check back periodically to see if your name was drawn. 
And the last giveaway we have is for Pirates Dragon's Treasure. And this is a game where players are all pirates, but instead of fighting against each other, you're trying to take out a giant dragon boss. And there's a few different dragons that players can fight against. There's only gonna be one included in each game, which adds a little bit of variability from game to game. The players are gonna be drawing from a plunder deck each turn. And there's gonna be treasure cards as well as crew cards or ship cards. And the ship cards give you defense, where your crew cards give you attack power. And then the treasure cards are used to pay for either the new crew or the new ship upgrades. Whenever you pay for a crew or a ship upgrade, you're gonna be putting that into your tableau and that's gonna be adding to your overall health or attack power. They might also give you some special abilities as well. But if you're not quite drawing the exact upgrades you're looking for, or if you're not drawing enough plunder to pay for those upgrades, you can also try to sell cards to the other players or to buy cards from the other players depending on what you're getting a lot of and what you're lacking. And any player can attempt to fight the dragon at any time, and the first player to defeat the dragon wins the game, but if you lose against the dragon, you lose all your cards and you have to start back at square one. So this is a bit of a race where you want to get enough crew and ship cards to get you in a good position to fight the dragon and potentially win, but you don't want to wait too long and hand that opportunity over to one of your opponents. And this giveaway is for a standard edition of the game and all unlock stretch goals. And all you have to do to enter this giveaway is the exact same thing. Head over to the Discord, check out the giveaways channel, click the little emoji underneath the giveaway, and that will get you automatically entered into that giveaway. And now let's go ahead and draw the winners for last week's giveaways. And one of those giveaways was run over on the Discord. It hasn't been automatically drawn yet at the point of filming this video, but if you did enter that giveaway, it should be drawn shortly after this video goes up. So make sure to check it out and see if you are the lucky winner. And the next giveaway was for Through Ice and Snow and a draw winner. I use this application here. And all these extra names down here are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you like this sort of content and you want to help make all these efforts just a little bit more sustainable for me, feel free to check out the Patreon down below. Definitely not required, but if you're feeling sympathetic to all the Fridays and Saturdays I've given up to make these videos, it definitely softens the blow. And all jokes aside, I do really appreciate it and it does make a difference. But let's go ahead and draw those comments and draw the winner. And the winner for Through Ice and Snow is... Is it even, is it even drawing comments? What's it doing? What? What is going on? All right, so it looks like this website's broken. I tried Chrome, I tried Firefox, I even tried Microsoft Edge. I, I was desperate. But it looks like there's another comment picker I can use. The only problem with this one is it doesn't allow me to add the additional entries. So I'm gonna have to do something a little bit different this time. So what I'm gonna do to make this as fair as possible is that I'm gonna flip a coin and if it's heads, I'm gonna draw a winner from the YouTube comments. And if it's tails, I'm gonna draw a winner from the Patreon entries. So let's go ahead and ask Google to flip a coin for us. Heads, I'm drawing from YouTube. Tails, I'm drawing from Patreon. Tails. So I think this should still work. It's just not gonna draw from the YouTube comments, but it should still draw from the additional entries. So let's go ahead and pick a winner and see who won themselves a pledge for Through the Ice and Snow. And the winner is Sean Gildersleeve. Congratulations, Sean. I'll reach out to you and let you know that you won yourself a pledge for Through Ice and Snow. And now let's go ahead and do the exact same thing for Citrus. So we'll flip the coin again. And if it's tails, we'll draw from Patreon. And if it's heads, we'll draw from YouTube. And it's heads. So we're getting a bit of variety here. Cool. So let's see who won themselves a... Oh, okay. That was fast. Congratulations, Howard Abraham. Just email me at adam at and we'll get that pledge all sorted out. And I almost forgot that to enter this giveaway, I also asked viewers to let us know if they could generate any resource for the rest of their life. Which resource would it be? And it couldn't be money or something that you trade for money. And Howard says that he would generate hardwood fired brick oven supreme pizzas. And I know for a fact that pizza is something that you can never get sick of. So very classy choice here. And that's everything I have for you this week. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you're all enjoying the excellent weather lately. If you're having excellent weather wherever you are. Thanks so much for watching. As always, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full.